Okay, excellent. Thank you all. All right, to back up a tiny bit, um, I'm a retired Naval officer, retired just a few years ago as a Navy captain, uh, former Commodore, and uh, was fortunate enough to have command of my own destroyer and uh, was in charge of all of our ships in Europe and Africa uh, based in Naples, Italy. Uh, my wife Ashley and I have owned many powerboats and sailboats over the years, and uh, in 2018, we switched to the dark side and are now cruising in a Legacy 42 fast trawler. Um, please note, for those of you, we, we will talk about some kind of engineering and technical principles. Um, I have a degree in rhetoric and an MBA. You do not have to be an engineer or a scientist to be able to work on your own boat or figure out navigation, et cetera. Um, if I can do it, then, then so can you. Um, I host the website uh, and Facebook group shown here as a pre free service like today's lecture service and uh, uh, our lecture series. Um, my business model in my second career is uh, that I basically give freely of, of the knowledge that helps all boaters enjoy their boats. And at some point, whenever one of our website readers or Facebook members wants to go deeper, then I'm available for, for, for hire for additional training, vessel deliveries, et cetera. My focus by name is on trawlers, but I've regularly done tra training and other things on power and sailboats. So today I want to help you all be brilliant on the basics so that you can expand your horizons and uh, be more comfortable getting places. Before we start, I do want to acknowledge we have a VIP in the audience, the regional commander of the United States Coast Guard uh, from the uh, Annapolis District has joined us, so she could uh, probably teach today's class, but we were talking about it before, and that I am certain that even though this is Navigation 101, there's a broad range of skill sets and experience in the room. For some of you, this may be a refresher, but there will probably be something you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I am still studying, despite all of those you know, Navy accolades and boat ownership, et cetera, I constantly study and, and, and always am learning something new, um, whether it's from the members on our website and Facebook group or from you know, questions of members like you, as well as discovering things on my own boat. Um, today, we're going to cover these topics, and to be clear, please ask questions during the presentation. Let's make this a discussion. Um, speak clearly, we are filming, and I will do my best to repeat the question if it's quiet. Any question that you've got means there are probably others here who've got the same question. I start, before we get into the navigation lesson, I want to review uh, one of the most important underlying principles of the operation of your vessel. Fundamentals of uh, cockpit resource management is where this uh, bridge resource management, which the Navy and sh commercial shipping industry later adopted, uh, for those of you who are pilots, uh, you're very familiar with this probably. We may have some ex-military pilots in the room, but also the same fundamental principles are alive and well in medicine, transportation, firefighting, and other high-risk industries. Even though boating is fun, there are inherent risks of operating vessels at sea, and so the crew resource management concepts are, are important, and I'll kind of go into those. The clarity and roles piece is really important. Um, many uh, couples or you know, small teams of people are frequently cruising together. Even if you f switch roles, sometimes you know, one partner's the captain, sometimes the other, there has to be uh, clarity in roles. There's, there can only be one captain per trip. And so if you do that swapping of the roles, discuss that and brief it up front today I'm the captain, or we're getting underway, today's Ashley's the captain, um, all questions are going to go to her, she's, she's getting 51% you know, of the vote throughout all those decisions. Um, Cross-training is key here, and I you know, won't go into the myriad of mishap examples that are out there, but there are quite a few mishaps that we all continue to read about in the paper, in media, social media reports, or whatever, of boating accidents in which the person who is the primary boater, who's got more knowledge, et cetera, on the vessel, sometimes can be the one who's injured or incapacitated, and the, whatever the casualty is, is magnified when the other partner hasn't cross-trained, hasn't paid attention, or hasn't made the effort. It's like, oh, I don't need to drive the boat. My partner always drives, or I don't need to understand you know, how to get this, get this started, or how the radio works, et cetera. So, I'm going to emphasize throughout some cross-training issues. 
Pre-briefs every time. No, it's not because I was in the Navy. We, no kidding, do a brief every single time we get underway. It takes about two or three minutes. Some of it's safety related, like we point out where the locations of the fire extinguishers and the life jackets, et cetera. We talk about responsibilities for, uh, for man overboard. And we talk about the you know, fundamentals of how to use the head. More importantly, how not to. I'm sure all of you experienced uh, guests on board who made some fundamental flaw of the, all the different complicated uh, head systems, et cetera. And uh, we do a preview for every time. I encourage you all to do that. Um, hint and hope, that one's in bold for a big reason. And lots, again, lots of examples of aviation mis mishaps, commercial shipping, and, and just recreational boating mishaps in which one member of the crew, doesn't have to be the spouse or partner, saw something that was going badly and then made some subtle hint. And that's why hint and hope is, is the absolute no-no in cockpit resource management and bridge resource management. Like there was a great aviation mishap of a crash on, on, on the ground of two aircraft and the first officer said to the captain, man, I've never, uh, you know, seeing the you know, runway lights at Denver this dark before. What he really should have said was, we are on the taxiway, this is not the runway, stop. And so same deal when you're in your boats and you're not sure, do not hint and hope, be crystal clear, there's a line in the water, stop the engine. Not, I think there's a line in the water. So discuss how you work those out with your partner and your crew, but I beg of you, for, for all of you, same with the captain, but for sure, the non-captain on each trip, don't hit and hope. I believe very much in checklists, again, uh, in codifying your procedures. Everybody's got habits, et cetera. Doing it the same way every time makes it not only efficient, but makes it much safer, especially we're always introducing a new crew member who doesn't know our procedures, help them out. Um, I also believe very much in repeat backs, and there's, there's a big difference between, you know, taking all lines and you hear nothing from the three or four mix of family and guests who are on deck, or, granted we overdo it a little in the Navy, sent, you know, taking all lines, taking all lines I, and then you get reports, all lines clear forward, all lines clear aft. We don't do the individuals on our boat, but, but I always insist that the bow and uh, stern folks talk to each other, and then I get the report before I put the boat in gear, all lines clear. I can see it generally from either of our cockpit positions on our boat, but having that double check to make sure somebody's line is still not wrapped in a, you know, their foot's in a line or something like that is really critical. So I encourage you, it's sometimes it seems awkward. You've got to talk about it and plan the top five or top 10 highest risk safety things like actually getting away from the pier, risking fouling a line, a few other key components, once making sure all of your swimmers are out of the water before you start the engine and put it in gear, things like that. And you work out your own behavior and your own procedures in a way that every time before you get ready to heave around on the anchor, all swimmers are clear, the you know, swim ladder is up, you know, whatever you work out, the floating line that you put in the water, get that for sure confirmation and work your procedures and discuss the plan talking about it, briefing it also includes getting the feedback from your crew. Um, very much, you've got to rehearse your casualties. The great thing about here in the Chesapeake and the frequent uh, wind blowing, lots of mylar balloons from the west give us all great opportunities to not only clean up the bay, but do the practice of maneuvering the vessel to a small, hard to see object. I've lost count of how many uh, balloons we've picked up out of the bay, but man, every time we see one, that is such a great man overboard practice. And we get into the rhythm, somebody grabs the boat hook, the, the maneuvering the boat frequently is the hardest part. Um, we'll, we'll talk about anchoring in depth. Uh, we, we don't go into, into abandoned ship, but certainly docking without thrusters. Um, I've got a, we've got a single screw fast trawler. We're blessed with bow and stern thrusters, but on a regular basis, just and it's not to show off, it's truly to practice doing the backing and filling needed for all of you sailboat owners in the crowd. You know about backing and filling and maneuvering with a single screw without, in most cases, bow thrusters. Um, it makes us better boat handlers, but 
Sure enough, there's one day I've lost my bow thruster. I'm really glad that I practiced it. Firefighting is in bold there, and that little picture is from a great story on the Boat US uh, Foundation training page, which I encourage is a great resource. In that, uh, that photo is from a test that they did where they grabbed kind of in a marina like this, like 15 or 20 volunteers who were all experienced boaters. They lit a combination Class Alpha and Bravo fire and then handed each person a normal, you know, 2010 BC uh, fire, fire extinguisher and watched them. Over 60% had no idea how to do it. The majority of them did not know that there's a pin that you must pull before the handle squeezes, the sweep low at the base of the fire, all of that stuff. I'm not gonna teach how to use a fire bottle today, but that was shocking to me when I read it. And if you have not operated a fire extinguisher lately, the rules recently changed on the expiration dates of those standard Bodhi size fire extinguishers. So you probably, or you could have an expired one on board that is no longer compliant. What a great time to practice and, and go over those procedures. Um, there's an article on the, on the trolleyguiding.com website that I wrote that talks about, you know, the Coast Guard firefighting minimums are just that underlined, professor stomping their minimums and that study that Boat US did proved that you know just one 20 BC, which is the typical thing that's required for all of our boats, is absolutely not enough. So, um, especially I like the idea of in the Navy we do the the rescue and assistance detail. I've got a giant big 40 BC available, and it's in the cockpit in case you know we just had a big huge fire up in Baltimore at uh, Anchorage Marina like three or four days ago. Couple of boats lost um, and massive damage to other boats and to the pier. Could that have been stopped by an, an adjacent boater with a big 40 BC? Maybe, but I, I want to be available to have that option. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to get into now. Now we get into the uh, what navigation is all about. Underway navigators cycle through constantly all five of these steps. Um, throughout the course today, I'll show a variety of chart images, including some paper charts, electronic nav charts, and uh, the proprietary hybrids of ENCs, electronic navigation charts that are made by the leading cartography companies like Garmarine and Raymarine. Uh, Garmin and Raymarine. Note that even though those proprietary charts, in my opinion, look better than the standard, and we'll see them later, than a pure government approved series S52 electronic nav chart, they're all based on that data. So don't worry that, you know, well, you'll see some ENCs and they look a little strange on the screen compared to your Garmin or your Raymarine or your Furuno system. Don't worry, as long as your charts have been updated, we'll get to that, you are getting the freshest ENC based data of US government approved charts. Um, and, you know, each of us has got a different method on our vessel and we also supplement them frequently, and I encourage you to consider this with navigation apps like Navionics, Aquamaps, Savvy Navi, et cetera. Um, they're all very good, um, especially I, I, I'm both a Navionics and Aquamaps user, and Garmin bought Navionics, so you're getting some of that, you know, the power behind that. So I'll display throughout here a mix of screenshots to make sure that it serves all of you so that you've all, you'll recognize some of the symbology. Um, now let's get into just kind of the basics of how we take a fix. Um, I'll start with the you know, history or the standard visual fix. Not all of you may have grown up with paper charts like I did. That's why I've got these beautiful pieces of artwork. Of note, last year at this uh, lecture series last year, I reminded the audience that the uh, Office of Coast Survey, a subset of NOAA, is discontinuing chart printing you can now no longer get the real heavy duty printed charts. They stopped doing that in September of last year. Some local vendors uh, will still sell the print on demand, but if you planned on buying one of these beautiful charts to frame on your wall, you better hurry up because they're, they're no longer printing them, but they might still have some available in stock. So if you want a full view of the Chesapeake or something to put in a frame and put on your wall. Uh, you need to act fast. So this is a hand bearing compass. Inside of here is a you know liquid view, uh, little yellow one, different uh, color, but the same brand. 
and this is how I grew up doing visual navigation around your neck. You look through it and you can see the magnetic compass course and I can take a bearing to that camera 029. And if that camera is plotted on the chart like that light, I can draw a 029 line. I shoot the light, I shoot that at you know 350 and shoot the mirror in the back at you know, like one uh, 099, drop three lines on the chart, and that's where I am. And that is the, the three-point minimum what defines a fix. And still, this is, I pulled it out of the drawer on our boat this morning, I keep this handy. Sometimes I, I like will cite a mark just in case to verify that GPS is still working perfectly and I've got a good signal. I'll look over the big compass that's in front of my helm. So yeah, I'll click you know, an object on the chart. You can click that like long point on your multifunction display chart plotter, click on it, your cursor reads out. It should bear 010 and either I look over the top of my big compass or whip this out. Yep, still, still bear 010. It's great to double check to make sure I'm still getting a good GPS signal. But GPS, and I'm gonna teach the rest of the course today based on GPS, pretty certain that we all have GPS on our boats, and uh, I, would, I would think at this point we probably all have chart plotters, and so that's the foundation of this. Uh, when GPS you know, first came out, it was great, but all the displays were just latitude, longitude, and so you had to use the you know, latitude, longitude along the edges of the charts and tick out and plot your little triangle for a navigation fix. The beauty of chart plotters is they do it and they drop your fix every second or so on the chart. So the advantages that you see here of GPS, of course, I don't have to tell anybody. Now I will note, and we, I'll dive into this in the next few slides, the guaranteed precision of GPS in the United States is 95% of the time it is accurate to within 16 feet. Therefore, and that's plus or minus, Therefore, if you go really close to a charted object and you've zoomed way in on your chart plotter and it shows good water, just based on GPS lack of precision and how it's processing from the satellites, lots of different reasons, we'll go into some of those of why it's not always perfect, you might be with inside that 16 foot error so please do not cut corners as closely as your chart plotter might trick you into seeing. Um, the, the WAS system, which is a uh, satellite-based augmentation system, it adjusts for some of the GPS errors. And in, in practice, many of us are seeing on modern GPS receivers accuracy to within a meter, about three feet. But you're guaranteed 16 feet or less, so keep that in mind. Um, and I'm sorry, let me back up the, the, uh, the, the cons there. Your antenna position, RF interference is one of the biggest challenges of getting an accurate uh, uh, receipt uh, of, of a good signal. Um, and you know, some of you may have older GPS units, the, the WAS system is a satellite-based system that transmits corrections to GPS receivers that are configured to take it. But if you have got an older vessel like mine and you've got a pre-2003 GPS unit that is ready for differential GPS, which was a series of ground stations and high-frequency radio antennas that transmitted those corrections to your GPS receiver, those were discontinued in 2022. So if you've got DGPS, differential GPS, and a very, very old GPS system, you probably need to consider getting an update because you're not getting the satellite-based corrections of the SBAS system um, augmentation. So if, you know, for a long time, we're like, oh man, I've got differential, I'm spot on, I'm within a meter, only in the United States and part of Canada, DGPS is gone. So if you've got a DGPS unit, then at best, you're, you're back to 16 feet. Now, the RF interference listed there, the most common source of radio frequency interference on a boat is LED lighting. Many of us have converted our 12 volt incandescents to LEDs and it's not the light itself, it's the light driver. 
Second on the list is USB chargers and USB devices. Down, down from that is battery chargers, TV antennas, solar or wind charge controllers, inverters, your VHF radio, and your radar if the GPS antenna is anywhere within the beam of your radar, which I often see, especially on power boats where they've got a small mast maybe and the radar and the little GPS mushroom are very close to each other. So if you are seeing what looks like anomalies or you're visually seeing your proximity to a mark and uh, it's not jiving on the screen, then you may have some interference issues. That it, Fixing that and figuring that out is beyond most of us, but uh, you know, we've got experts here in Harrington North who can, who can certainly help you with that. <clears throat> um, this is, now we're gonna go over kind of the basics of aids to navigation where we'll talk about how, to, how you plot it on the chart, but then there are other is, in the case of you know, major channels and even minor ones, aids to navigation have been provided, not only there for, you know, they pre-existed, pre of course, well before GPS, um, but they're there you know, both as a reminder and a, and a confirmation of, uh, of what, you're, what, you're, uh, what you're seeing versus what you've seen on your, on your chart plotter. The red right returning often thrown out there, a little memory aid, is incomplete unless you add the other words that are in there. It's not just red right returning, it's keep red markers on your right when you are returning from C. And from C needs definition. It's basically from the largest body of water to the smaller one. So in Chesapeake and its tributaries, C is the Chesapeake itself, so every time you're going up South River, West, West River, Chop Tank, Patuxent, whatever, um, red's on your right because you're going from the big body of water from C to the smaller body of water. When you're actually at C coming in from Norfolk, the reds are on your right. As you come up the, the Chesapeake flowing north, you're still coming from C to deeper inland, so red's on your right. Now the the odd one there, and I've got it uh, pointed out, is the junction buoy. And you'll see that whenever two channels diverge. And you've got to think about the phrasing of the top color. They're either red, green, red, green, or they're green, red, green, red. You'll usually see the first three colors on, on all but the biggest ones. Whatever is the top color on a junction buoy, it is saying, Consider me a red if your intention is to drive in the main or preferred channel. So in this case, great, great little diagram, courtesy of the US Coast Guard, is the big channel is clearly up the center of the slide, and the smaller channel is smaller, skinnier water going to other, some other little area. If you want to stay in the, in the main channel, consider that buoy a red. If you wanted to drive to steam into the, uh, the smaller channel, the dotted line, then consider me the secondary color so you come right and it's a green that you keep on your left. Any questions on that? Because that is a fundamental. Yes, sir? The top of that uh, junction buoy to the left, I can't, maybe that's my eyes. Is it, is it a dark spot there or is it red all the way across the top? So I'm sorry, yeah, the junction buoy, the, you know, this one is the junction buoy right here. And so it is red over green. What's the, is there a number on there or on top? Um, it, it, because it's primary is a red and that's, it's, it's not showing in the number and it may be that my pointer obscured. Um, it's going to have an even number because okay. it's, it's, it's a red. It, a number on there. Correct, correct. Yes. And, and, and all major marks have got a number on there and they, they'll appear on the chart in quotes, whether it's an ENC or a paper chart, you know, this is buoy number two, you will see on the chart, in fact, when I click to the next image, um, two is in quotes, this tells you it's a red buoy, it flashes red every six seconds, you know it's lighted because it's got the magenta dot at the bottom, this is paper chart notation, we'll get into, get into, uh, uh, the, the digital notation, and then the, the safe water mark, which is this red and white one, 
is frequently the sea buoy way offshore at the entrance to something. Those are always letters and the letter is in some way intuitive. This one is Cuddyhunk Harbor up in, the, up in New England, but you know, the, the, the fair water mark, you can go on either side or red or white. Um, these are rare, but coming in frequency. Two black dots shows an isolated danger mark, painted black over red. And, and the red here has nothing to do with position. It's two black dots on balls on top and black over red. And then uh, here is a range marker. You see these if you take your boat up to, uh, up to Baltimore a lot. And on the chart, it's fixed object because its, it's navigation position is reliable. It's a filled in dot as opposed to an open circle at the bottom, which is what buoys have. This tells you that these are plotted on the chart with such precision that I can take a visual bearing, or sometimes if you can see it on radar, a radar bearing to the object and truly rely on it to plot it. The reason all of these circles are open is buoys are on a chain and they move. And so for absolute precise navigation, you cannot shoot a bearing to a buoy and get a reliable position. Um, some are lighted with big lights on top, and then others are not. These do not have the purple dot or the magenta dot filled in, so these are clearly unlighted buoys, a red and a green. Any questions on red right returning or paper chart notation? Yes, sir. Yeah, in the upper right, uh, the non-lighted buoy, look at the shape that's depicted here. Right. Right, the, the, that's paper chart notation if we, if we uh, we'll, we'll get into, I think I may have, uh, there, there we go. So I've, I've added, this is what, if th this is the international notation that you'll see in ENC charts if you have that displayed or depending on the brand, um, whether it's Garmin, Raymarine or whatever, you can toggle between international symbology, which I've got in these little white boxes, and your question is specific to the can buoy, which is typically a cylinder is green. Many, many years ago when many of us first started boating, they were black, but they're all green now. And then the nun buoy is conical in shape and is common to the reds. Um, and then this symbol is basically a major buoy, major light, and you'll see this throughout uh, the international notation. And then finally, this is a general beacon. I, I guess the one, you know, though, though I lament the loss of the beauty of a printed chart, part of it is I grew up navigating on them, but there is definitely a simplification that was intended by the makers of the new international symbology. Uh, part of the uh, United Nations organization uh, runs the uh, International Maritime Organization, IMO, and they're the ones who set the standards, they're the ones who reveal the collision regulations, et cetera. And you know, this is pretty simple. It's a beacon. I know it's got a red triangle top mark or a green triangle top mark. Um, it's a little simpler, not as pretty maybe, but I'm used to it. Yes, sir? Yes, uh, I'm used to the, 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 the ones you see there, the red and the green. I've never really seen the international we, or anything. Okay, and, and you, that is probably, like, like me, I've got a, a like, circa 2010 uh, Raymarine uh, chart plotter, and I'm running Raymarine charts. Every time I update them, I know I'm getting ENC data, but it's still displayed in that familiar U.S. paper chart notation and symbology. As we all over, you know, as I, as I budget for my next uh, improvement of navigation, when I upgrade, I'll still have the choice to toggle whether it's Garmin or, or you know, like Raymarine calls theirs, the Lighthouse series. Garmin has Blue Chart and a couple of other proprietary stuff. They're still offering that symbology, but I think as we get towards more and more use of, you know, I mean, now we're all purely using electronic nav navigation charts. It's the software you're using happens to be converting it for familiarity. And, and I still have mine displayed in, in this US notation only. 
I can toggle back and forth, but I still am familiar with those and, and intuition is important. Yes, ma'am. Um, I mean, true AI, artificial intelligence, is not, you know, that, that to me would be software is anticipating changes. What we will get into in a little bit is that some chart makers are incorporating automated crowdsourcing. There's some advantages and there's some disadvantages we'll, we'll get into. If your boat is pro and, and the equipment is properly configured, some members or you know, users can transmit their sounding data that their boat is constantly collecting as you're steaming along and it gets transmitted to Raymarine or gets transmitted to Garmin and it automatically updates the charts. It does not update the government ENC chart, the electronic nav chart, that's only based on actual surveys, but it does update what we'll see later is a proprietary version like Navionics and Garmin call it sonar charts. You can turn that on and get amazing detail. We'll talk later that there is some risk in thinking that that detail is of greater fidelity than in fact it is. Yes, ma'am. Which one? I'm sorry. Yeah, the, that's isolated danger. Basically, the, this the. Yeah, isolated danger mark, it's marking this, you know, rock or piece of land and then back to, let me go back to here, that's what a, the mark looks like. It's specifically warning of this object. And, and if it's submerged, it might be right on top of it like a rock. Question in the front row. If I'm going up the main, chan right. main uh, channel and I want to turn left into the other channel, yes. do I have to fix on the red triangle? Is that what I'm looking for? The red triangle. Um, right, correct. Like once once you've turned left, you know the question is once once you're going up the main channel here, the preferred channel, dark blue line, and you want to hang a left into this other channel, which is the intercoastal waterway, as marked by the magenta line. As soon as you turn, you're still coming from C at the bottom of the screen. So whatever this river is that's going deeper inland, red on your right when returning from C. And well, since you asked about Intercoastal Waterway, we'll get into one of the weird esoterics. We have the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway, which starts in Norfolk and goes to Key West. There's the Gulf Coast Intercoastal Waterway that's from you know, Texas to like the, almost to the armpit of Florida. And then there's a short little stubby in ridiculously shallow and poorly maintained, which is the New Jersey Intercoastal Waterway. <laughs> um, do not go further north of Wildwood if you draw more than four feet on the New Jersey ICW. But let's say you're going south from here to Florida and there's, I didn't have it on the slide, there's red right returning from C for the intercoastal. It's red on your right when going around the clock, meaning around the United States in a clockwise manner. The intercoastal sections and, and the intercoastal waterway, as you know, was you know a combination of natural with dredged connections to be able to make this almost, you know, con con or it is continuous from here to South Florida, from Norfolk to South Florida, inland waterway for commercial traffic. When you're on the intercoastal, the red is on your right. However, and here's a, wait, here we go, here's a, whoops, uh, point, point. Here's a good example. There is a tiny notation on only these buoys that are along the intercoastal. You see these little tiny uh, yellow squares or yellow triangles. In those cases, those are saying, regardless of the navigation buoyage, which you don't want to ignore, that's what's keeping you from running aground. When you come to a junction, then if you also want a reminder, a visual reminder of, hey, which way is the intercoastal? Then they put a little tiny, again, this is the red right round the clock. If I'm on the intercoastal, I consider this a square, so it's a green. If I'm on the intercoastal, this green day marker to enter into this little channel is actually an intercoastal yellow triangle, 
So it's a red when you're going on the intercoastal. And that can be very confusing. And so, but I, I mean, the, the challenge here, make sure I didn't just turn off my mic, inside mic. Turn it down a little bit. Oh, you turn it down, okay, good. Oh, I'll, okay, good. Good, good, all right. Um, so everything is, and we get to another beware the magenta line. Talk about a foot stomp. We'll get into the magenta line and its risks. The notations for the intracoastal waterway, I would consider they're hints. They're not, I mean, I mean really, it's, it, the, you know, the, they're not navigationally significant from a grounding collision avoidance or grounding avoidance standpoint. They are pathway reminders. You know, when you're coming, and this, this suggests, you know, you're, this is coming south on the intercoastal waterway, because of today's class, you know how to read buoyage. You're coming up on a red buoy that leads to C. You know that, or sorry, that, that red buoy is for this small, uh, this little, you know, harbor entrance or that little cove, whatever. You know that that's a red for going from a bigger to a smaller, but as you're heading south, you, you acknowledge that. The, the intercoastal yellow triangles and, and squares could potentially lead you to, oh wait, wait, which, do, which way do I go? I wanna go to Florida. On a paper chart, there's a purple line. On some nav navades, there's a purple line. The purple, the magenta line, so it shows up in red, red light. The magenta line is notoriously filled with errors. It regularly is drawn on the wrong side of buoys. And God bless them. I'm from the South. Bless their little hearts. People run aground following the magenta line every day. In fact, there's been major lawsuits about that. We'll get, we'll get into that really bad one in Port St. Lucie, Florida. So there's another question back here before we move on. Yeah, yes, sir. So on the international symbols, uh, on Chesapeake Bay, and I'm going to go to Baltimore this year, and maybe Norfolk, there's a lot of the international symbols that are on Chesapeake Bay. Well, the, keep in mind that the, the, the buoy still looks like you're familiar. You know, the, there's no, you know, they will look like this still. It's the charted symbology if on your chart plotter you have selected, and there's usually a choice, um, on especially the modern ones, Raymarine and, and Garmin, et cetera, you can choose, do I wanna display the ENC, Electronic Navigation Chart Notation, which includes only uh, the international symbols, and, we'll, and again, I'll, throughout the brief, I, I, I'm deliberately showing a mix on, on real screenshots from real nav systems, but they are intuitive. You know, the, this one, I didn't do the full thing, it would have a little green ray. In, in, in paper chart notation, everything lighted just has the magenta ray regardless of color. So it's not always been intuitive. You know, it's like, okay, these are, you know, it's a range, so these are, these are uh, quick flashing red, is isophase red, that's a, that's a flashing green, that's a flashing red. They all show a magenta ray on paper chart notation. One of the benefits of international notation is you get a green ray or a red ray. On that international notation, red buoy two entering the channel is a nun. Correct. And visually, it looks exactly like red number four and yet the international symbols are different. What's the difference again? This is minor and this is major. So the difference between this small mark up here and a pretty hefty sized or one of these sizes. Major light, vice minor, you know, little, like we see in, here in like Harrington North, you've got a couple of little small little baby nuns. They're gonna show up on international symbology like that, but then just a little further out, a big buoy in, in the bay is gonna show up like this. And we'll see that on some subsequent charts. All right, clear on this? Okay, good, all right, let's, now, so, so here's the display option, as I was just saying. So this is Garmin on the left, and this is pure ENC term, uh, symbology Depending on your brand, you can switch between the two. Simplified International is frequently what's on the choice. You can do Simplified International, 
So some of the newest ones you can actually still display paper chart symbology on your chart if you, if you prefer that. And frankly, I don't want to dictate a preference because I certainly grew up on these, but I've quickly converted to these that are pretty intuitive. That's obviously a red, it's, it's the, the beacon symbol. It's lighted, it's got a ray, that's what I was talking about. The international symbology gives you a red ray and a green ray to indicate what color. That's definitely an improvement from, on the paper chart, all, all lighted things are, are rays. That is pure uh, ENC symbology. This is the simplified, you know, it's, this is slightly more intuitive. I, I like that the marker, the, the, the black shaft on the marker is also the color of the top mark. We all know the pole is, you know, creosote dark brown, but um, that's what I frequently, I mean, I use that, that's what my Raymarine display looks like. I could toggle that way, but here, here's the perfect example, and I'm not gonna dictate which you start to get used to because I am confident for our lifetimes that the major manufacturers will always give us this option. Um, and over time, due to a series of complaints to IMO and, and the Office of Coast Survey, some of this ENC symbology has in fact improved and become a little more intuitive. I think just a few years ago, they started adding the little triangles, which is a representation of the day board that's on top of the pole. So that's clearly a, a green square, green square, red triangle on top of the pole. Um, and this is, of course, Harry Bay. This is our own backyard right here, showing soundings and feet. Um, and then that is, that's the zoom view of the inner harbor right inside of Harrington North, where you make the turn to the right. And so you've got a mix of a buoy symbol um, at the top. Brad gave me a pointer, I need to use it, sorry. So there's a major buoy symbol, it's lighted, it flashes every uh, six seconds and it flashes blink, blink, blink. Wait six seconds, blink, blink, blink. This one is a quick flashing green every one second, a uh, flashing red every four seconds, quick flashing green every one second. And the, these, the small m is uh, height of the object above mean lower low water, so that's a 13 meter tall pole. And then the light, the large M is miles, that's how bright the light is. So this is a four and a half meter tall post with a light that is only visible to four miles. Any quick, yes sir? Who do you contact if say uh, the number on top of the day marker is missing or in the wrong direction? Sure, that is, uh, you, you can skip 16 and go straight to channel 22 alpha. And that's where the Coast Guard, that's their working channel that they'll always shift you to. That's completely routine traffic. I mean, you can hail them on 16, shift immediately to 22 alpha. Um, and, you know, in the, in the scheme of, uh, of Mayday, Pon Pon, and Securite, that's really a Securite call. You're just giving them a heads up. And then a few minutes later, after you've made your report, they'll probably call you on the phone. They wanna get everything about your name and your vessel and all that stuff. They're gonna log it. They've got a, a book called The Light List that has every one of these serialized. They know exactly where it is. They'll schedule it for a buoy tender to come fix it. But then within probably 20 to 30 minutes of your call, you will hear the petty officer on watch start broadcasting a local notice to mariners that, you know, day marker, two at the entrance of Herring Bay in the Chesapeake is missing its top mark. And you'll hear that, you know, for hours and hours and to remind everybody until, until actually days, in fact, until they get it fixed. All right. So um, the, here's, here's the lesson of, yes, you can trust GPS, but can you trust the chart? We talked about all the errors that might be inherent in GPS's ability to communicate to your GPS receiver and your antenna, as long, assuming you've got all the, the you know, LED light interference issues and your antenna's in a good spot, it's not in the beam of your radar, you're getting the best GPS signal you can get. It's guaranteed to 16 feet accuracy 95% of the time. How good is the chart onto which your chart plotter 
is putting your own boat symbol. On April 17th of 2021, the former yacht of John Wayne, the Norwester, um, ran aground on Charles Point Rock at the entrance of Prevost Harbor uh, in Stewart Island, Washington, just uh, north of Seattle. Uh, one of the, this is one of the many San Juan Islands in the Inland Passage, beautiful boating up there, I haven't done it, between Seattle and Vancouver, Washington. Of note, the tidal range here is between five and eight feet. And as you can see by the track lay, that's the red line, out on Norwester's chart plotter, the captain thought that he was in good water for the vessel's six foot draft. He's plotted his track just outside. He's in that like second lightest color of blue, which is 12 feet, but he's awfully close to the edge of that uh, darker blue ledge, which shows six and a half feet right there. Um, and these are display of soundings and feet. Um, but he was cutting it close, but he ran solidly aground on Charles Point Rock. Now, I took this screenshot from the Navionics chart viewer because Navionics is one of the many ones uh, that allows user added notes, and those are depicted by this green circle. Looks like a little you know, first aid kit symbol that if you click on that when you're in the Navionics app, uh, then that will pull up the note that some user has put there. And the date on that note is April 27th, so 10 days afterwards, and some clever user put in, there's a rock here, don't hit it. <laughs> so not all crowdsourced data is helpful. That is one that's a little more snarky. Um, and based on live footage available on YouTube, you can you know, Google this, filmed by an observer who got his boat as close as he could to the rock, Norwester was approximately on the green spot. In this chart coloration, green is a rock that uncovers completely at low tide. And so as you can see the pictures that she ran aground hard on the left and then it's a wooden hull and destroyed the bottom as the tide came up and down a couple of times. It didn't lift her off because she's hard aground and it, it sank. Um, so how did this happen if uh, you know, Norwester draws six feet, how did she get there? And so um, as discussed, uh, your GPS receiver's ability to know where it is in latitude, longitude with an accuracy of plus or minus 16 feet with the satellite-based uh, system, it's down to about plus or minus three feet in North America. That's not a dispute. However, when you plot that position on paper or your chart plotter does it for you, on whatever display you've got, it's still plotting on, assuming you're updating your charts, we'll talk about that. Uh, it's plotting it on as accurate a nautical chart as you've got. Um, so you're steaming right along where you wanna take your vessel right next to a shallow object, you could easily run aground. Um, there's also something that's available on many apps and some of the more modern chart plotters which is called water level correction, where it's getting real-time tide data, and instead of showing you the numbers of the worst case the water depth could be, it's showing you what it is right now. And here we've got you know, 14, 15 inch tidal range. There, it was five to eight feet. If the master had that turned on, then he may have plotted his route the moment he laid his track down it might have been high tide miles away in that area. It looked like he had tons of water and he drew his own track. So I encourage you all to disable the water level correction function so the numbers of soundings that are always showing on your chart are the worst that it could be. Um, the, the, the source data is the real issue. It's that even though ENC charts are you know, the most modern way to display it, the surveys themselves might be very, very old, sometimes even hundreds of years old. I have crews on, on a chart in the Northern Pacific in which the crews or, or the survey data is of the era, and we actually looked it up when I was on the ship, the survey was done by Captain Cook. And that was still, and it was way out, it was in really deep water, but in the section that was really deep, 
that was a survey. And so it's Captain Cook on a sailboat and his guys out there with lead lines taking notes with you know, the best chronometer they had, their positions were approximate, the soundings were potentially filled with error, they weren't using side scanning sonar, so they were missing the sea mount that was just right next to them that was outside, all of those errors are there. Um, then there's also projection distortion, where all of these charts are Mercator charts. You know, we learned in, in school that you know, Greenland is not nearly as big as it really is because a Mercator projection is, you know, it's basically you lay a flat chart on the roundness of the globe and that place where it touches is the projection point and the accuracy of the plot when a spherical Earth is converted to paper gets distorted at the edges. So depending on how far you are from where they started their survey in 1939, it's less and less accurate. It's not a ton, but it's extra feet of precision error. Um, the manual process by which NOAA cartographers then converted that survey data into every single point that you see plotted, that was done by humans, artists initially, and then when paper charts were converted to raster navigation charts, RNCs, which were the in-between paper and electronic nav charts, they were merely digital conversions of a paper chart that had been made by a human, and in some cases the survey data was from a sounding, you know, in, in the 30s it was a, a fathom phenomenon. But, um, and then the datum, that instead of that single reference point, when GPS satellites started going up, GPS satellites fly in a perfect sphere. As you know, Earth is not a perfect sphere, and, it, and not just that it's smushed at the ends, there's high and low points. You know, the true level of sea level here in the Chesapeake is a different distance from the center of the Earth than, than the level of sea level, you know, 5,000 miles away. But WGS 84, which is this mathematic perfect smoothing of GPS, it had to be a sphere, so that induced an error. And then finally, the conversion from raster charts to RNCs to ENCs was yet another di digital step. And then finally, we've got the natural and man-made changes. Shoreline certainly has changed over the years. Um, weather and currents change the sands on the bottom. Dredging, of course, changes it for the better. Sea level rise is happening, and so that's changing soundings. And, you know, if, if the ENC that you're displaying is not updated, you haven't done your chart updates, and depending on what you've got, if you've got an older system, like mine, it has a CMAP chip. You pull the chip out, and mine's, you know, again, 2009 or 2010. It's a chip with big flat metal blades on it. I have to take it home, plug it in, or, or bring the computer to the boat, plug it into this goofy chart reader thing, stick that into the USB, go on to Garmin Navionics site, download the updated chart to my CMAP, and then plug it back in. If you've got one of those and you aren't doing that at least twice a year, please start. Because not only is your chart filled with all these potential errors, when they move a buoy, you won't see it because that's part of the update. And the beauty of ENCs is they are updated every single day. All of those reports, not, not, not the missing top mark, but new survey data or when the Coast Guard buoy tenders have to move the buoy location, all of that is reported and it's constantly updated. And then I already mentioned the disable the water level correction, please. Yes, sir. Raster versus vector, can you explain that? Right, the, the question was, what's the difference between raster versus vector? ENCs are now vector charts. So instead of, a raster chart is a picture, basically a digital conversion of the paper chart. But with a vector chart, which is what all ENCs are built, every one of these pieces of data, whether it's the, the depth, the, the shorelines, the latitude, longitude, et cetera, they're all built in layers. There's hundreds of layers in a single chart and it's vector math. So instead of, you know, think about like if you zoomed in on this, you know, with a really big magnifying glass, which is also why you don't over zoom on your multifunction display because eventually you could zoom so far in that you are trying to be more accurate than the pencil lead width by which the chart was originally built. 
The vector charts skip the idea of that pencil lead potential error, but most of your chart plotters will also have usually it's like a red crosshatched error or a little box that shows up that says caution over zoom. Don't ever navigate in over zoom position because then you'll see own ship and you'll be so zoomed in that it's like, oh, that rock is like, you know, it's two inches away from me on the chart. Well, you're over zoomed plus all of these imprecision items and that's when you have a, an expensive jarring experience on the bottom. Um, any questions before I move on on, on basically, and, and I'm not saying don't be afraid to leave the dock. What I am saying is, because that may get you to this point, but, but what I am saying is you cannot do what the master did. You can't even do it coming into Harrington Harbor. It's like, oh, I could see on the chart, I could see it. Man, I'm just right by that, by that rock. I'll show you how old the soundings are in Harrington Harbor in a minute. Yes, ma'am. Great. And it said the channel was 12 feet deep. Oh. And as I was coming into that, I looked at our old chart plot, which had C maps. Right. And it said it was five feet deep, uh -huh. which is exactly what we draft. Ah, scary. So, and panic. And when we get into that channel, it was five and a half feet. Mm. And what did your photometer read? Your well, that was five. Oh, it was five and a half. Actual. Okay. So the Navionics was off by seven feet. And I've seen that in a lot of the bay, that Navionics. Here's why. Significantly off, and I guess it's from the user. Well, no, here's why. And this is, this, I, 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 let me just orient you to what I've thrown on this busy slide here. The, in the bottom right is, and this is this chart, 12270 of this section of the Chesapeake Bay. To orient yourself, here's Herring Bay right here in the lower left. And you know, all this is the Eastern Bay. When I took this square and blew it up, that's what you see. This is the source data and the age of when the surveys were done. It makes sense that the most recent surveys are the ones shaded in blue, and to orient you to the main chart, that's the main channel going all the way to Baltimore. Here's the Bay Bridge right here. That's, of course, in blue, and it's an A category, but the last time it was surveyed was 2016. So we're, we're getting close to the 10-year mark on how accurate that is. But for our vessels, that's okay. The depths in here are you know, 30s through 90s. No, no light blue stuff. The shallowest spot on the entire channel is a 50-foot wreck. So you can trust the depths and the bottom topography in the A zone. But you were, sorry, headed to the Eastern Bay? So all of this is Eastern Bay. You know, here's, here's uh, uh, the, the bridge right there. Um, at uh, uh, Kent Island. Um, if you're making your approach, you haven't even gotten to Kent Island yet, you are running in 1940 through 1969 surveys in this B3 area. On, on the sill between the main river, here's Poplar Island right here, as you cross here, fortunately it's, it's really deep. Um, well, actually the, the stuff that sticks out from Bloody Point Bar way out here, is you know two feet, three feet, et cetera. That data is before 1900 to 1939. And then as you make your approach to wait for the, the bridge to open, you're in 1900 to 1939. Every storm, every bit of current, sea level rise, et cetera, has somehow changed the bottom topography since 1939. So, um, be careful. And then the newest version, this is for ENCs, instead of specifically referencing, but, and, and you know, I, I am implying we can't trust before, just because it's old, because the world has changed. What the ENC world, and I'm sorry, this is, okay, this, this is the ZOC, the slide got a little distorted here on this display, but these are the newer categories, and in this case, they give you a confidence level. And it's because the standards by which surveyors got their contracts and had to survey to a specific requirement 
are captured in, instead of just rolling my eyes at 1939, they may have been really good surveyors. It's that in the D category, or actually the, the, the D at the bottom says it's worse than Charlie, so that's not helpful. But the Charlie standard, which is the 1949 standard, so that covers all the B3 zones, maybe, if it's something that was done between 1949 and 69, the only accuracy that they had to deliver in those sections was plus or minus 1,600 feet and accurate depth within six and a half feet. So it sounds like you just experienced that exact seven foot error. No, I, I wouldn't say that because what I saw was that Navionics was consistently different by seven feet from C maps, and Navionics was wrong. Not just in ah, was oh, there you go. And, and so that may be, depends on, you know, in theory, if you're synced with Navionics and you've gone into the menu and you've done, you know, update charts, then you've gotten the freshest version from the ENC database, but that ENC database can only draw on the 1939 data. I think Navionics is putting user-generated data for the depths in some of those places. We'll get to that only if you have sonar charts turned on. And we'll, I'll show the difference so, so you can see. If, if you have just the regular base chart, it is updated with ENC data and sounds, I mean, it could be that in that area in 1939, they sounded 12 feet. And your C map isn't, you said the C map was. The C map's old. The C map's out of date, but it's right. And but it was more correct. Interesting. Right. Now, that also could have been a positional issue of GPS, your boat's yeah, antenna. I'm telling you that this is all over the place. No, I believe it. And so, I mean, the bottom line here this is a caution to all of us that. You know, steaming in skinny water that is within a few feet of the known depth of your vessel draft is just a bad idea. And so whether it's John Wayne's boat or your own boat in the Eastern Bay, be careful, slow down, and don't cut close to the little teeny tiny stuff. Excuse me. Yes. So the basic, I'm a, I'm a local boater here, is to use the ways as for the satellite communications setting of my GPS, it has several different settings on it. Right. You said Waze. Oh, the WAS, the WAS, right, right, uh, right. The ENC, um, and the, and the uh, master, the master view versus sector. Well, no, I mean, I mean, to me, vector, I mean, vector is the newer chart. You, normally, you cannot pick raster versus vector. It's, that's the underlying data that is in the chart, but your, I mean, as long as you are tracking satellites and you've got enough in view and there's a section in the menu, if you don't see, you know, there's, there's 27 satellites, 24 are active, three are the standbys, just the United States system, and then you've got, you know, EGNOS in, in Europe and, uh, you know, Baidu in China and Russia, GLONASS, all these other satellites are there. The newest chart plotters are receiving signals from all of them not just, you know, a U.S. chart plotter doesn't just get uh, Navstar GPS data. It's getting it all, and if you've got a modern enough unit post-2003, you make sure that you have, if, if there's a choice to turn it off, most, uh, some, some may, some not, you are enabling the WAS system, which is the Wide Area Augmentation System, you're getting satellite updates. All of that enabled, you should, in practice, see position precision within about a meter, about three to three and a half feet. Yes, ma'am. This is a very local question, but given how you're saying these spaces can be highly inaccurate, do you, would you have any recommendations on approaching Neff's Narrows, which is... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me while I puke in a trash can. The only place that I have run aground. And of course, in the Navy, we get fired when we run aground. So it's very, you know, just, you know, wound in my heart that I actually touch bottom. Um, but in theory, if you haven't been boating in the Chesapeake long enough, if you haven't run aground, right? But we'll get to Naps and Arrows and why it is completely jacked. And I, I, my boat draws four feet ten. I've got a single screw with a big keel. I cannot go to Naps and Arrows, and, I'll, and I now know why. I, I checked, the, checked the data afterwards on a Corps of Engineers dredging report, which I'll show you in a moment how to do that. And it tells me I will never ever go there. If you if you draw more than three feet, I wouldn't I wouldn't go to Napster. But we'll, we'll I'll I'll show you why. Um, don't take my word for it. And again, crowdsourcing 
lore is a terrible idea. Part of this course is all about, I want to teach you how to find it yourself. I want to teach the people to fish so that you will always with confidence know I am in good water. I know exactly where I am. I'm safe to proceed. Um, so speaking of depths, the little numbers that we see on the chart, um, all these little numbers, these are soundings. The good news is, is that they, in theory, are the worst case scenario. And so this is the definition of all of the different scales and definitions of depth, um, all soundings. And I you know, grabbed a little, this one's height, and we'll go, we'll go to the next one is, is depth. Up in the corner, I and mean, this is part of why I miss, miss paper charts, you know, right here in the corner, it says soundings in feet at mean low or low water, heights in feet above mean high water. And so in the case of soundings, we'll get, get on the next chart, it's at almost as bad as the tide ever gets. If you're deciding whether or not you can take your boat under a bridge or under an overhead power cable so you don't get zapped um, if you're on a sailboat, uh, then what's plotted on the chart is not quite as bad as it could ever be. It's plotted at mean high water. And let me get the exact definition of you know, those, those areas circled in green. And this, this whole graphic is from chart number one, which is how to read the chart in official terms. I highly recommend this book by Nigel Calder, which walks you through the somewhat you know, scholastic and dry topic of how to read a chart symbols, but he explains everyone and kind of the so what. Um, the, uh, the mean high water is, you know, they're almost as bad, and, and chart number one, again, is the, is the reference. Um, and I've added the absolute worst case in red, which is highest astronomical tide at the, at the top, and bottom is lowest astronomical tide. I've exaggerated the red line, and the gap probably isn't as, as much above mean high or high water, and as much above, it's probably an extra inch or two here, here in the bay. But, um, but for any of us with taller superstructure or mass, or certainly with sailboats with mass, the charted height for a bridge is merely mean high water, which means the average of all the highs, and if you've looked any time on our tide charts here, we frequently have semi-diurnal tides where you've got a really high and kind of a not so high tide. If you include the lower ones of the two in your 19 year average, then the number is going to be less. And so mean high water is that number. It is uh, the much more conservative mean higher high water, which takes of the two highs of the day, it only takes the average of the highest of the two for 19 years. I'm always surprised that they don't do it in mean higher high water because I had a sailboat for a long time, but they don't. And so when it says, you know, 22 feet on the chart, and your mast is 21, you may want to wait for the bridge to open <laughs> or don't go under. Um, and then similarly, the, the definition of mean lower low water, now that's very conservative. It's of the two lows of the day, they only look at the lowest of the two and they average them over a 19 year period. But the worst it could ever get in you know, a combination of you know, every once in a while when the moon is really close to the earth and you know, the moon and the earth, or moon, sun and earth are all perfectly lined up. You get the, the spring tide happens once, once a month, uh, the super highs and the super lows. Um, that's as bad as it gets. Now the chartlets here show Kent Narrows um, up here at the, you know, in the Eastern Bay, right here at the top. And so that's a paper chart view and uh, that's like a Navionics view, and that is Aquamaps ENC only. And so the, what it tells you, and I, again, I kind of missed this. This is very intuitive, big letters here that say, right, print it on the chart. I don't have to look it up. Um, Bascule Bridge, vertical clearance is 18 feet. That's when it's closed. You got to know that. You got to know what bascule means. Well, the, here they've helped you out here. It, it's hard to see. Oh, and I just realized I've displayed this in, in uh, in meters when I cut and pasted this, it says CLR space CL, clearance when closed, 5.4 meters. Um, if I had properly turned that on to feet, then they would all be reading in feet. And then same here on Navionics, it is helpful. It says closed 18 feet. 
Um, and then the space is, you know, this says 48 feet. That's the gap, the width. Length of the hole, 48 feet, 48 feet, uh, 25.9 meters is, yes? Some of these bridges are arched underneath, right. like spot creek. Oh, sure. No, the, so is this clearance to the highest part of the bridge or the lowest? Clearance at the highest part of the bridge. All, always, the question is, you know, some bridges have a curve to them. Always go for the center. And I, I don't have a picture of that, but, you know, in, in North America, the center is marked by a, two red lights, one on your side, one on the far side of the bridge. And when you line them up, that's a range of the actual center line track that is the guaranteed best depth or best, best height for the bridge. Um, now, when any bascule bridge opens, those red lights, when they spread apart, once it's fully open and only when it's open, those green lights or red lights turn to green. And so you'll know you're clear and fully open, especially if you're in a sailboat. You want them green and you want to be watching the center line as you go through. Um, so here's the depth side of that, and again, to orient you on the, on the what I've, I've dragged and dropped several uh, things from different locations, this is the uh, ENC view with international notation and, uh, of, of Herring Bay, and the question is, and a reminder, you know, it's at mean lower low water, so every number here is almost, and, and again, I like, I like depth, so you can see that the only thing lower is the lowest astronomical tide. That happens you know, every few years, and the difference is in like a couple of inches shorter. Please note, the word astronomical is the foot stump. All of this data in no way accounts for weather-based water height phenomenon. I will not call it tidal. We see here in the Chesapeake, we, we live on the Magathy River, if there is a sustained west or northwest wind for a couple of days, the depth at our dock, and we can see across the neighbors, is incredibly low. That is in no way captured on any tide table or the little tide icon that you can click on on Navionics or Aquamaps, or you know, this is the, this is the screenshot of when you click on the, uh, the little tide gauge symbol that's in, sorry, it's, it's right here, the, the tide gauge symbol that is in the inside of Harrington South, when you click on that, this is what pops up. If that's one of those weeks where we've got this crazy west wind, remember winds are named by where they come from, a west wind blowing for days, sucking all the water out of this side of the bay and packing it over in the eastern bay, that will in no way be reflected on the tide chart even though it's cool, real-time, internet click of a button tide heights, it will not account for that. So in last year's discussion, someone was asking about, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry for the, uh, the Band-Aid here, a little reminder for those of us boaters, wear your sunscreen, had a little skin cancer chopped out this week, so please wear your hats. Uh, someone said, hey, uh, are, am I good to go across the bar? as I leave Harrington North and just take off and, and not honor this red and go all the way down here. It's like, holy moly, that's a long way to go. You know, it's a few hundred yards or whatever, quarter miles, something like that. And someone else offered up, bless their heart, well, you know, just follow one of the crabbers out. I'm like, whoa, okay. Uh, nothing against the waterman industry or the nature of the good old boys who do that incredibly hard work. It's that their vessels are designed for the bay. A Chesapeake dead rise at, on plane draws like 18 inches. They've got a single screw protected by a full keel and a bronze shoe that connects their rudder to the keel. So even if they hit bottom, they're just going on through. So please do not use that as your metric. <laughs> Plus, they are so familiar with the route they probably don't have a chart plotter going, and they are not aware that they keep going past a two-footer or past a three-footer. Now, granted, this is, those are plotted at the worst part. So, well, it's high tide. I can get through there. This is just uh, for today. So I, I put the little dot on for noon. So right about lunchtime, if you're getting underway, then you're just down from, you're at 0.66 feet above zero. 
Please note that this morning's 3 a.m. tie was below zero. So it's one of these that are, are pressing the lower of the lows of the average. But if you get underway right now, then you've got an extra six tenths, you know, maybe seven extra inches on top of that too. No, thank you. I draw way too much in my bud. But even if your bud is like, I mean, if you draw three feet, then that's a problem. And then back to the previous slide, and that's 1969 data at best. 1940 to 1969 is what plotted this entire area. I think we should probably honor the red. Um, and there's a really shallow spot right here that's kind of in the middle of the channel as you're, as you're heading out. Um, <clears throat> So hold on, let me just uh, catch back up to my own notes. Um, yeah, and then uh, also I'll, I'll point out the, uh, the rec symbol here. Um, this, you know, any, anytime you've got symbology that is surrounded by dots, that tells you it's a hazard. Sometimes you'll see this symbol for a rec um, and it doesn't have dots and it'll be in really deep water. You can probably find some of those in here in the, in the deep stuff. Um, the reminder of this older symbol, I mean, it's the one I'm familiar with. Think of if a three-masted sailboat sank and that's all you could see just barely sticking above the waves. That's why it's that line with, with three through it. That, if I, when I click on it, on the ENC, I clicked on it and it said, no. So how shallow is it? You cannot trust the number four that's to the west of it. You cannot trust the 10 sounding that's close by. That does not apply to the wreck. And unlike paper charts where some of these unique uh, shallows will give you some extra data, like here's a shallow on the way to St. Michael's. It's, it's an 11 foot spot, it says reported 2005. Well, was that reported by somebody with a good enough GPS to, approx to report that? It turned into something on the chart, but you know, how much do we trust it anyway? So, and then uh, on the paper chart, that same rec has the letters PA, position approximate. The ENC accounts for that by making the circle that's around the rec a little bit bigger, but the definition of position approximate includes, uh, hold on, that, yeah, zone, it's, it's part of the zone, oh, actually this is even worse. This is part of the zone of confidence 1930 to 1939, and the position approximate was greater than 1600 feet position accuracy. So I don't know where that wreck is, <laughs> and neither will you if you decide to cut it too close. Um, somebody asked about the, uh, the narrows, and so I, I have, oriented this, this is Aquamaps because it's got a, a handy tool in there, but other, other software does it, where you can turn on the US Army Corps of Engineers, it's spelled out with their acronym, U USACE on the, on the app, and you can toggle those surveys, and that's where they take you know, a very precise uh, vessel with, with perfect uh, GPS receiver on board, and scanning sonar and they just go back and forth and back and forth and you know th this is what's on the chart but on their on their surveys there's like hundreds of little tiny soundings all in between and they just connect the ones of a similar area but it is incredibly precise and that's the area that they surveyed now caution if you currently use these or you like these there is a subset in the settings on any of these apps that will let you display the Army Corps of Engineers survey data, where you can select how old a survey you're willing to display. And there is a choice for all, please don't use that one. There's three years or greater, 1.5 years or greater, or, or 1.5 to three months, and then off. Months may be a little tight because they've only got the budget to survey these areas so often. This I have displayed at 1.5. When I switch it to three years, it disappears. So it's relatively fresh. It's less than three years old, um, and uh, or sorry, less than 1.5 years old. So it's pretty fresh. But what this tells me is, is that, you know, the and, and this one's weird too. That that this marker is in, it has no top mark on it. It in fact it, it in fact is a black pole, and so it's left over in its 
uh, in its you know, painting symbology from the days in which some green markers were black. So that's a green. And you know, it looks OK when you're on just a regular chart and you don't have that turned in. That was the day I went through there. Um, and ran aground right about here, I think. Uh, yep. Uh, and so it looks like you got a red, a, for, a green, formerly painted black, red, green, no problem. I make a little slight turn in here, and I'm good to go. Clearly, you are not. Let's zoom in to where Tate ran aground, right about there. And I mean, there's no good, I mean, yeah, maybe if I was able to. And, and note that the majority of this six ish foot in the medium orange, you've got to be on the buoy line, right on the line. And of course, visually, you'd be like, no, no, I'm going to stay in between the buoys like I always should, because of course, they dredge in the middle. What, it, no surprise here. This is not a critique of, of you know, Army Corps of Engineers dredging. It's that you know, half the bay runs back and forth through there every day if you've gone through you know, I mean, it's ripping currents through there. There's a lot of sand that gets moved around. So that's, that's one of the features. And again, this is not Tate Westbrook giving you crowdsourced data. Hey, I ran aground, so don't go there. I'm giving you the reference. The Army Corps of Engineers thing properly displayed tells me my boat can't go there. Um, and then, even, I mean, that number three there, and this is actuals. And, and granted, they've, they're, they're displaying these converted to mean lower low water as well. So worst case, you've got a three-footer that you have to deal with, oh, and a two-seven um, that you've got to deal with as you make this little slight turn to start. So um, caution if you draw, heck, I mean, based on that, if you draw more than like two feet, I'd be careful. Um, I, know, I know that restaurant there is great, but yes, sir. <laughs> Go by car. Correct. We'll, we'll get, we'll, I'll dive into crowdsourcing and its risks, but Active Captain is a Garmin proprietary crowdsource tool that includes Army Corps of Engineers data. We'll talk about Bob423 and his tracks, tracks and routes and all that. Yes, sir? Um, you know, I've done most of my building on a Potomac, so we're new to the Chesapeake, and I've been down there for ten years, so I don't know the economy between all the data points that I Sure. No, great, great question. How, how do you rely on your own depth sounder, your own boat's photometer? The real key is, and, and this is my recommendation, but there's two ways to do it. In every chart plotter, assuming that your photometer is tied into your chart plotter, if you've got a boat where you've just got the depth displayed, then it's somewhere in the menu of that little you know, display on your thing. But in every chart plotter that has an interface with your photometer, there is a way to set the offset for, you're basically teaching the chart plotter where in the boat is my fathometer transmitting? And so in my boat, I measured from the water line, and it was just when it was on the hard, but you can, you can estimate it just by you know, seeing where the water line is outside your engine room and going down in there and striking a line on some structure and then dropping your measuring tape down to where it's actually leaving the hull, plus you know, two inches of solid glass on my boat, that sort of thing. Mine's about two feet below the water line. So I, g I went into my menu and subtracted, and you've got to play with it. It's like, and, and I literally did soundings there at the dock when I was doing this. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in you know, 11 feet of water. It's displaying nine when I went into minus two, then it showed 11. And that's because I like all of the, and this is, you know, kind of, I, I'm not a pilot. Any pilots in the room? Private aviators, okay, the, you know, the pilots, one of the things is check your gauges constantly, and there's this constant scanning of gauges. I scan my gauges when I'm, when I'm you know, piloting our boat, and I want everything to be in the same scale, effectively. And in this case, I want charted depth to equal display depth. 
And so if I go over a 10 foot area, even if you know here it's minor tide, I expect it to read somewhere between 10 and 11 actual, depending on the tide. If I didn't have that offset, then I would drive over a 10 and I would see eight. And I would drive over the 16 and I would see 14. And I would begin to lose confidence in the visual cues that I'm getting. So please, everybody, go into your menu, do the measurement, and display what it's like. Now, if you don't do that, then you are displaying depth under the keel, which might be more reassuring to you. Then it's, I, I see an eight, it's like, okay, good, I just went over a 10, I know I've got at least eight feet. But unless you've got one of the very nice and very expensive forward scanning sonars, if you got it wrong, your display tells you at the same instant as you hit bottom. Um, now granted, having, it, having sonar depth or, or fathometer display equal charted depth doesn't prevent that either for me. My, my, my fatho pings straight down as well, but I like the reassurance of fathometer equals charted depth. I know something's not wrong because if fathometer does not, like if, if I'm steaming across the 16 as I'm approaching, headed back into Harrington North, and chart says 16 and fatho says eight, that's a massive difference. I'm probably over here. And so that's the first indication that I've got, that I've got a position error. And maybe, you know, my cable for my GPS antenna has come kinked or disconnected or something. And then I slow down, dead slow or even stop and begin checking because fathometer does not equal charted depth is a major alarm for me. So the, so the, Sounder electronics that, that hold the industry. Right. Are they accurate? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're pinging hundreds of times a second. That's really old technology. Right? Oh, yeah, but I mean, self calibrating. So, so it should be. Oh, yeah, no, I, I trust the FATHO. I mean, even, you know, if you've got one of those ra old round low rants clickers. That is, I mean, it's, it's time distance. It's, it's measuring, you know, microseconds or milliseconds of how long it takes a pain to go back. And especially in the shallowness of this area, the, the only minor error you might get is if you're in a muddy bottom area, then the pinger's going a little bit through some of that debris before it hits something firm enough to bring the sound back. Around here, you're off by a foot, you know, so. And, and it's gonna probably It'll make it appear a little deeper because it's going through the, through the pluff mud, but the nice thing is the super soft stuff, if the sonar can't get a good return on it, if you touch that, then you know, it, it might it probably want to take your paint off. In the back. Um, I was gonna ask if the calibration changes at all between fresh water and salt water. Oh, it's, I mean, it's imperceptible. I mean, it's the, I, I spent a career hunting submarines and propagation of sound in the water is affected by salinity. But it's, you know, depth, pressure, and temperature are the biggest. Salinity is so, I mean, it's literally like in millimeters in the depths that we're dealing with. So, sir. When I'm going through this calibration process, where do I find an exact known depth? Or do I do this on the hard where I can make that tape measure and make it to the ground? You, you can, I mean, the key, I mean, I, 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 it was, that was kind of a feedback check. The, the, the thing you need to check, and, and this is the only reason why it's like, reason I caution make sure you're going in the, in the right direction. Is it plus two or minus two? Sometimes the menu and how it tells you to do that is, is intuitive. Probably a perfect thing to check the book or Google your own book and make sure, and it will describe, is the offset plus or minus to make it think that it's in the right thing. But to me, the, the precision of the measurement is the waterline to its location. And, I got that, but what, do I do this measurement on the hard where I can actually measure the distance to the ground where I'm getting the reflection? No, well, if you. I position my boat over 6.8 there in the harbor and trust that that's 6.8 feet and then do it. The most reliable, since remember this is an average and the bottom has changed sometimes since 1939, I literally did it. I did it at the slip at Harrington Harbor and put a pole down with a flat base on it so I truly knew where I was on the bottom. Measured the actual depth I was at, I was at like 9.8, went to my fatho, it said you know, 11.8, I knew I was in the wrong direction. I then 
you know, subtracted to, or, or what, you know, I basically fixed it so it made sense. That's the only way. You can't do it on the hard because the phenomena only works through water. And so, you know, you're, you, you can certainly get absolute precision, like hanging a plumb bob off the side and then putting a big yardstick across the bottom. You can get that water line to measurement really precise, but. As, as a double check, I mean, as a double check. But you're right, if, if, you, if you drove over the 16 and it read 20, you would realize you went in the opposite direction. You know, but but I, 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 you know, a little, a little OCD, perhaps, and so I did it with my clunky method. Um, <clears throat> so the, we talked about zoom earlier. We talked about the risks of over-zooming, but uh, there's also the don't forget to zoom. And so this is the view of, uh, this is an ENC display, um, and at a, what I would consider a reasonable level of zoom for cruising back into, into uh, Herring Bay and the approaches to uh, Harrington North. But until I clicked one click deeper, those two obstructions only showed up then. So when you're approaching any shallow area, and we're inside the shallows because the colors are getting bluer. Um, zoom in and out, zoom in and out, zoom in and out. And, and then plus there's some places where it'll tell you on the chart, you know, caution, zoom for extra detail. That, that prompts you to zoom. But, uh, and then, you know, the, the obstruction, you have to click on the obstruction on an ENC. On a paper chart it tells you, I'm hoping it says, uh, yeah, submerge piling three. Here, you have to click on it, a little menu pops up, scroll a couple of lines, and it says three feet. This nine foot sounding is in no way related to the nearby obstruction. So click and zoom. The nice thing is the layers have tons of data. The disappointing thing compared to the paper chart world is the, uh, the data, sometimes you gotta find it. Um, <clears throat> now some notes, as I mentioned, are only on deeper zoom levels, uh, or sometimes they're, the note is cryptic and refers you to the Code of Federal Regulations. Nobody's gonna look up US law, but the Code of Federal Regulations is found, all of them, in the Coast Pilot. You can get the Coast Pilot online, or if you're a geek like me, you have one on board, because I wanna be able to quickly flip to that area and say, hey, what is that? What's the warning? I mean, this is uh, Salem Plant, and this is on the eastern edge of the uh, Delaware Bay. So if you go up Chesapeake across the CND Canal and down on your way to Cape May, you will pass by, not this close, I zoomed in on it. It says security zone, that gets my attention. In this purple line, what is it? See no day. Well, here's no day on the paper chart. Um, and then on the ENC I clicked, it says exactly the same thing. Check your Coast Pilot 3, I went there for this chart and it talks about that you can't get inside of there and it's a nuclear power plant. They don't like people intruding on, on the nukes. And then on the right is our own Herring Bay and you get to that one on an ENC by clicking on the exclamation point. And all these little lines, and, and as soon as, like this line and the little triangle means there's some information uh, landward of that line. As soon as I clicked on this, the, the area here, actually, sorry, this is not Herring Bay, this is uh, uh, just down south the, uh, oh no, sorry, this is, this is zoomed in on uh, Aberdeen. Aberdeen, yeah, Aber Aberdeen Proving Ground at, at the north end of the bay. When I clicked on the info, there's several choices available as I kept, as you click through, the, the line that it's about to describe lights up in bright blue, and it talks about military area, if you scroll down a little bit, it talks about live fire and guns, and, and so, you know, I stay away. Um, all right, next. Okay, and then we were talking a little bit about crowdsourced data. Yeah. Sir. Before you go to this, you know, when I go from Herring Bay to Annapolis, I, I see all sorts of weird, on the regular NOAA charts, you know, like the Coast Guard charts, they're all Oh yeah, fish haven is a beautiful thing. That, that's right here on the chart. It's uh, a blue box. The nice thing is on the paper chart, it says 
Obstruction, fish haven, authorized minimum 15 feet. And that's where they put objects, sometimes old cars, sometimes these cool little concrete things, little hex shaped things, to be able to build a natural bottom for fishermen and fisher persons. So when I'm going up towards Annapolis, this right by this green buoy 85 Alpha, there's frequently several boats around here. Now it says authorized minimum 15 feet. So whoever maintains that or maybe originally put it down there, well, if it's a reef, it's probably growing. So maybe it's 13 feet. I'm totally clear to drive straight across it from a navigation hazard. For me, it's a collision avoidance issue. I always lay tracks well clear of it because there's almost always some vessels here uh, who are you know, sitting right on top of it fishing. All right, in addition to that, so coming out of Herring Bay, and if I, if I head uh, northeast, there's a good chance I'm going to run into that massive oyster. There's stakes out there. Oh, the pound net. It's about just like 100 yards. Oh, yeah, no, we talked about that. In fact, I don't know if I've got, I don't know if I've got the pound net slide still in here. I, I talked about it last year. Um, I, hold on, let me see. Let me see if I've got pound nets. Um, the, oh yeah, there's two. Um, hold on, do I get into this this afternoon? Yeah, I guess I should have included in this one too. Hold on, there we go. Um, pink. All right. Boink. Okay. Where are the pound nets? Well, there's two of them um, uh, right here. And this is my, please note, just the, note the grainy screen. This is what the best 2010 had to offer in the Raymarine E120. Um, I have, note, they're clearly marked. That's because the day Ashley took this awesome photo and a series of others, we because, and it's in really deep water. I mean, it's amazing, 26, 23, 22 feet. These are really long poles. And this is one of the days where the folks who own this permit were actually actively fishing it. And so you can see the net. It's, most of them are either in an arrow shape or a double-ended, like an hourglass. And they are aligned across the prevailing current so that the bluefish and other fish that they harvest bump along what is a long fence of netting and then go into the purse at the end and they come by, I think every day or so, and uh, haul that purse net out with a big crane and take the catch and they sell them by the pound, hence the name pound net. Um, I got really close to them because you can in deep water and marked a couple of spots on my plotter You've got you know, a man overboard button where you can instantly drop a spot or you can drop a waypoint on own ship. And this one is the larger one of the two. Fortunately, it's marked by a green buoy, buoy 83 alpha. This one is in no way marked. There is a website uh, by the state of Maryland Fisheries that plots all over the entire Chesapeake, all the places for which permits have been applied. And that's it. That's all you get. And the position is, is completely proximate, you know, disappointing in its precision. And it in no way indicates which ones are being actively fished or not. And no way indicates if they got a permit, are the poles still there? And all it says on the chart under here, under the words, it says fish trap area. Heads up. That's it. That's all you get. So for me, I created these and saved it as a route. It's a little three-point triangle, and this is a single route. I named it in my route-saving part, and I display them. You can display routes or turn, hide or display. I leave those displayed all the time so I don't forget. Now, the good news is, is that they show up really well on radar. All, all rounded things are really good at returning radar, and here you've got a forest of round objects. They're incredibly great radar returns. They are required by law to have them lighted. And what you see that this seagull is perched on top of is the yellow blinking light like you might see in a construction site. They're battery powered. There was a point that season when this guy was compliant with the rules. It's got it required to be lighted at one end only. And I guess the regulation doesn't say anything about changing the battery. So, um, and, and so the, you know, we know where this one is, but 
where are all the rest? Oh, whew, be careful in the Chesapeake. Um, it's, which is why, you know, going in a strange and unusual area of the Chesapeake at night without a really good spotlight and a radar may not be a good idea unless you absolutely know the area. Daytime still, I always cruise with the radar, even in crystal clear conditions, and I have my radar displayed right on top. This afternoon, we talk in depth about, about, uh, about usage of the radar and how to properly use it for navigation, et cetera. Um, the, uh, we, we talked about crowdsourced data. So here's a, here's a view on the left side is normal Garmin display. On the right side is Garmin's proprietary uh, thing called sonar charts. There's an equivalent in Raymarine, I forget what, what it has. I can only see this on my iPad running the Navionics app because my version of Raymarine is so old, it doesn't, it, it, I can't, there's no switch to turn on the cooler charts. What these come from is anybody whose boat is properly configured, and back to your question about how do I, how am I certain about configuration of the sonar, what it does is if you've got one of these modern Garmin's or modern Raymarines and it's all Wi-Fi enabled and you're getting constant real time or periodic chart updates live, if you enable this function, you are also transmitting your soundings every time you're underway, which is awesome. So here we've got a fix to the 1939 data. Um, this is near real time crowdsourced data, but what if that person didn't have their sonar configuration turned on properly. They don't, they don't come check your boat before you become one of the crowdsourced contributors. Now hopefully, just like Waze and Google Maps, I mean, when you, the same kind of crowdsourced stuff as we drive along the highway is, you know, there's, there's a, a little, uh, you know, speed trap. Nine reported. I'm gonna slow down for that one, because that means, you know, at least nine people who've gone by have clicked on the screen of Google Maps and said there's a, there's a policeman sitting there taking you know, radar pictures. You asked earlier about AI. The one good thing about Google Maps is instead of scattering nine different police symbols all along Highway 50, because every single person that drove by touched the screen and reported a police trap at a different moment and a different GPS coordinate, different lane they were in, it fuses them together, and so that's low-end AI. Garmin, I trust them, you know, multi-billion dollar publicly traded company, they're doing some kind of fusion. So if somebody cruises by and their boat, Fatho, reports four feet instead of 12, they're gonna discard that and they're only gonna take the, the center of the bell curve. Now it is interesting that even though that was a 1939 sounding, it says three feet, when I zoomed way in, there, in fact, is a shallow spot. It's actually about five feet now. Um, but, and then, you know, similarly, on the chart without sonar charts turned on, it's a green plus, not particularly helpful. Herring Bay Anchorage, good holding, March 22. Okay, someone got away, didn't say what actual depth was observed. Somebody got away with it. But sonar charts shows that where that person was when they pushed that button were somewhere between eight and six feet. So this is much more conservative. That's gonna keep you safe. That's good, I like conservative. Some other of these crowdsourced items, sandbar extends west. Well, I'll try and keep my language. Well, no kidding. Of course it does, because the, you know, the red marker is not like a point, and so that's not helpful. And then, I, I appreciate fishermen, but bar for perch might not have been worthy of dropping a little point on, because I see those points, and I usually query them if I'm gonna check it out. Um, the top two, again, yeah, now I remember, uh, yeah, Garmin Active Captain, you mentioned that earlier. Similarly, the Active Captain app allows that same sort of contribution. And then when you display the Active Captain layer, you see this extra stuff. You also see the crowdsource comments. Now, less accurate, hence my caution symbol, is track sharing. There are several available. Um, the Waterway Guide, which is this you know, great book that you've got, and they've got an excellent website as well, there's a waterway guide alerts function. I encourage you to ignore it, because it's just as helpful. Oh, yeah, and this one, which is a floating platform, somebody labeled, it's the net. 
I'm from Tennessee, I can use that accent. Um, I don't know what that means, but it's not the net. It's, it's, you click on it on the ENC and it says platform, comma, floating, comma, condition ruined. So I don't even know if that platform's still there. There's another platform that's much closer to Harrington North's entrance, which I do see, but I don't know if that one's still there. But anyway, so I discourage you from that mainly because the fidelity of the inputs, as you can see, isn't always reliable, but the risk, which I think is greater, is that, and same with Facebook, I just, on, on my own Facebook group, someone posted a question the other day saying, hey, a few days ago, somebody posted that there was a floating log at the approach to Saint, Port St. Lucie. It's like, are you kidding me? And so I tried to not come off the top rope and say, you know, um, Facebook crowdsourcing of float moving water hazards in particular is not the most reliable source. So I wouldn't use that, but um, so that's, you know, that's a plus, but we, we've, we've talked a lot about how to set up your chart plotter. So I'm going to go over the real fundamentals and I realize I'm, I'm getting close to time. So I've got to speed it up here. A few more slides to go. There's a difference between north up and head up. I like north up, but it's because I'm used to it. It matches the charts I'm used to looking at. Um, heads up display is what you have when you're using Google Maps or Waze in your car and your route is right in front of you. Certainly great benefit for river and canal, et cetera. I don't want to dictate, don't do, it's like, hey, this guy's been in the Navy, he prefers north up. It's only because that's the way I grew up and I'm used to it. If you and your crew find that head up display is more intuitive, use it. Because if it's more intuitive, you're going to rely upon it more. And what's in front of the window is going to match what's on the screen, especially with contact avoidance, AIS tracks, and other vessels, et cetera. Um, uh, I believe since pretty much everybody here grew up with feet, there might be a, a meters person in the yard. If you prefer meters, then make your depth in meters and make sure your fathometer is in meters. I do feet. Um, nautical miles, 100%, because everything, with exception of the intercoastal waterway, it's the Army who runs the Intercoastal Waterway, they use statute miles, but everything else is nautical miles in every book, every reference, every calculator you're gonna use. Set your safety depth to contours, we're gonna to get to that in a second. Um, I, everything in red here, I've got a follow-up slide. Uh, set your own vessel depth, because when if you're gonna use auto, auto routing as a hint, you gotta fix auto routes, we'll get to that in a minute, you gotta tell it how deep your vessel draws, round up. I draw 411, I put six feet in there as my safety depth, so I can never go over six feet on the screen and it'll tell me. Um, and then I'm a big believer in the course of a ground vector. We'll talk about that. Contact speed, that means the, the speed leaders on other vessels, to me 12 minutes is about right. Um, and then vectors is true motion. You can set it at relative so that if you're, you know, somebody's heading this way, you're heading this way, you're on a collision course, their relative vectors pointing straight at you. But it doesn't look right when you look out the window. I believe in true vectors. This doesn't mean true versus magnetic. It means display the vector coming out of the other contact in the way that they're headed. So when you look out the window, it's like, yeah, I'm looking at his port beam. That's what, that makes sense on the screen. And then disable the auto turn mode with your autopilot. Some of your systems, mine does, and, and all the modern ones for sure, if you've got the same brand, and sometimes it doesn't even have to be the same brand. Autopilot, you can set up when you are following a route that your boat will turn on its own when you reach a waypoint. Holy moly. Think about what that would happen if you were driving along and Google Maps said, you know, sometimes it'll tell you, it's like, turn now. And you whip the wheel over and there's a car in the other lane. You know, letting that happen is going, and regularly, often reported, is, leads to groundings because you didn't zoom in on your plot and make your plot properly and it leads to collisions or to minimum violations of the rules of the road. It's much better, talk about hint and hope, when I'm about to turn at a waypoint and Ashley says, hey, why don't you just turn a little early and then you'll miss all four of those boats that are coming. Like, oh, thank God, yes, I do not have to, by God, go to waypoint 14. I plotted that last week and that is my route. It's not sacred and you don't have a right to your route. So, yes, question back here. So you wouldn't trust the Well, I like the alert that says waypoint reached. And, and in mine, it's the same excruciating alarm that 
was on the engineering control console on a destroyer and it stops my heart every time it beeps and it's loud and I cannot turn it, this volume down. But it's like, oh wait, it's time to turn. And then I go to the chart, I check, I check the windows, I check traffic and then I turn. But there's an automated function that most modern plotters and, and yeah. things have where it'll turn for you. Absolutely not disable that, danger. Um, and then finally, you know, check it, check it off and you can't just trust GPS blind to look out the window. So here's the, this is the safety depth issue. Yes, sir. Could you explain the course over ground? Yes, we'll get the course over ground in like one or two more slides. Oh, okay. One more slide. Um, first, safety depth. And this is just like if, if head up versus north up is more intuitive to you, use it. Talk about cockpit resource management. Ashley prefers head up. And it's because she didn't spend 28 years in the Navy looking at radars and charts north up all the time. She's, her, her electronic navigation experience is Google Maps. She's used to head up, and we just had this discussion the other day, it's like we're either gonna get a second display or the main one is gonna be a head up and I'll keep the iPad in north up for my company. But uh, the other is set your system up to be intuitive. If you haven't set your safety depth, and this is depending on each brand, it's display depth or safety depth, whatever, in, uh, in the Garmin world, and this is a Navonics display, but it's the same word in Garmin, is, is safety depth. When you set it at 12 feet, then everything, and it basically it splits it. You, I, I put in 12 feet, anything deeper than 12 shows as white, Anything in between, whatever you set of that, it's gonna half it. So I set it at 12, I get dark blue at six feet or less and light blue at 12 or less. With my boat drawing four feet 11, I can carefully go over light blue. I'll pay attention. Even that one's a little tight, that's seven. But I cannot go through dark blue. Set up your own display, talk about the aviation world of checking your gauges. I wanna be able to, you know, this, you know, I step at the way at the back of the room and that's about the size relative to my eyeball that the screen appears. I wanna be able to see own ship steaming along in white or light blue. And if I see dark blue out in front of me, well, hold on, wait a minute. And so it's totally intuitive, it's constantly giving. I don't, without that, then I have to, as I'm tracking along, I've gotta check, okay, 28, 20 minutes, minute, minute. you know, this is safety depth set at 60 feet. You get some color variation, but it's not enough to be reliable for instant corner of the eye uh, reference. Question about course over ground. That is the difference between, and, and I currently, I, I personally have only course over ground displayed, which for me on Raymarine is, is bright green. Um, you can also display heading, but the difference is heading is the way the boat is pointed. My heading is straight towards the wall but I'm steaming along in a current, and so my course over ground vector is that way. And so course over ground, I'm gonna run aground. Heading makes me think, if it's heading only, then I might blissfully think that I'm cruising right along here. What if the course over ground, what if I was in a really big westerly current, winds are named from the direction, currents are named where they're going to, a westerly direction was setting me like crazy down onto the shallow. If I didn't have course over ground, that's literally GPS telling me you are moving over the Earth's surface on this exact vector. And I make it infinite because that tells me, you know, am, do I need to make a one or two degree course adjustment to correct for this current to make my next turn? And you can see it all the way off the screen. In this case, the boat's heading and the compass is going to read. Let's, you know, this looks like about uh, like, you know, three, three, two, zero, maybe, maybe my heading is three, two, five. I look at my compass, it says three, two, five, but course over ground reads three, two, zero. I'm crabbing to the left because of the effect of something outside the boat, usually current, sometimes wind. Um, and so I highly encourage you to have course over ground and then contact links. This shows some uh, AIS contacts. Contact length is 12 minutes for each of these. So you can just tell without having to click on it, how fast is he going? Well, he's going slower than this guy. And then 12 minutes from now, 
both of us are going to have a collision. So that's, again, an intuitive thing. If you set it less than 12 in some really slow moving vessels, they're going to have such a short stubby vector that it may be hard to see. Oh, and, and then the right, the right side is a screenshot of a real uh, vessel underway, just a slight difference between heading and course over ground vector, very minimal uh, current is affecting that. But, um, then auto routing, we talked about that, and that's where you put your own depth in. The auto routing al algorithms are getting better, but they're still not reliable without flying the route. And so what I did, this is Garmin display, uh, Navonix was the tool, but it's Garmin's data. I wanted to go to St. Michael's, so I just clicked once for own ship for the start of the track and note, you know, this is Herring Bay. I wouldn't build a track inside an area with like five or six, seven turns. I'd start my track as soon as I clear the buoy or clear the day marker there, click once here and then click just outside of St. Michael's Harbor. And this is what the algorithm does. Well, it honored the red buoy, even though the red buoy is for ships going to Baltimore. It didn't need to swing me that far left. That's okay. But in doing so, it also has a, let's try and achieve the straightest point between two lines algorithm. In doing so, it put me way on the left side. Therefore, it's like steaming along in the left lane of traffic and wondering why all these people are honking at you. Everybody coming out of the Eastern Bay, per the rules of the road, is staying to the right side of the channel. This takes us really close to this buoy and this shoal. Again, really close to this buoy. The buoy may be out of position. And again, and, and, and auto routing will really jam you in these left, left curving turns. If, if you do a plot auto route from here to Baltimore or here to Annapolis, it will hug the coast. And in doing so, everybody coming south from Annapolis, you will be in a constant head on situation. You'll need to come right. You can't make them go right because they'll, they'll run aground because they're doing the right thing. They're staying to the right side of the channel. Here, it crosses any outbound traffic and then, sorry, the display bent off, goes on the wrong, wrong side. So if you're gonna use auto routing, not a bad idea, then you've gotta fly along the route, zoom way in, make sure you're not missing any other obstructions and stuff like that, and then add waypoints or drag the line. So I didn't need to honor that red buoy, so I dragged the line, got me to the right side, added the waypoint here to keep me on the right side of any outgoing traffic, adjusted this for traffic, this was gonna have me right on top of the buoy, so I drug that one over here, added a new route to swing wide, because as you're coming through this very tight turn, anybody coming out is gonna be on the green side. The previous auto route cut the corner, would have created the collision, and then same here, I did that. So if you're gonna use auto routing, and it, certainly auto routing is great for a quick trip. It's like, hey, Ashley, let's go up to Philadelphia. How long is that gonna take? Click here, click Philly, auto route, takes 30 seconds, goes brrrr, and I know how long it's how, how long in distance and how much time it's going to take. Um, for voyage planning, start with the end in mind. We get into that in the afternoon session if you're coming coming there. Um, equipment configuration, uh, 13 and 16, always, 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 always. You're required to do bridge to bridge communication on the channel 13, which by law is only one watt, so it only transmits just a few miles. You can talk on 13 as long as you want. It's not a hailing channel. It is the bridge to bridge navigation and collision avoidance channel. If you need to call somebody by name and make arrangements, do it on 13. Everybody needs to have them both. Pretty much nobody here has got a radio probably that does not have a dual watch function. Even my handheld has a dual watch because all decent radios younger than 20 years old have two receivers and one transmitter. So you can always have 16 in the background and 13 as your primary if you need to talk to somebody. Um, if your radio screen looks like this at the bottom right, no MMSI, or if it says no position, or if it has zeros for Latin long, then the most valuable invention in decades, the digital selective calling or DSC system, is completely useless and unavailable to your boat. If you have GPS wired into the back of your radio, that's where you'll see the position. If you see no position or zeros, you've got a problem. Or if you see no MMSI, when in an emergency 
and you lift and press the button for five seconds underneath the red cover that says distress or alert, little red toggle. It's like launching you know, missiles or something. Little red button here. You press, you hear a beep. On some advanced radios and HF radios, you can select what the nature of distress is, but most of our radios don't have that. What it does is it transmits over the digital channel 70 your position that you're in trouble and because your MMSI number is registered with the description of your vessel, it knows when I press the button, it's a white over blue hold 42 foot power vessel and here's my position and I'm in distress. Then it lets me or Ashley or any of the crew then turn to fixing the casualties, stopping the flooding, fighting the fire, maneuvering for man overboard, et cetera, and help is on the way. Now the radio is going to light up. Coast Guard's gonna call you. They're gonna try and work you through their checklist and no kidding, there's nothing, nothing disparaging about the junior watchstander who responds to a DSC alert. They have a checklist. They're in the Coast Guard, I was in the Navy, we do checklists. They wanna save your life and that first step is communications answer up and just say, I'm in the middle of fighting a fire, more to follow. And they're gonna wait. If not, then they're gonna go through the, does everybody on board have their life jackets on, all that stuff. So, um, and the AIS, for those of you who've got it, another great invention, it, you know, vessels can transmit their location. It is required by law for everybody 200 tons or greater. It's optional for all of us, but it's not a panacea because even if you've got AIS tracks displayed, like we saw those red triangles on a previous slide, everybody doesn't have it. Please raise your hand if you have an AIS transmitter. Maybe a quarter of the group. Raise your hand if you have an AIS receiver. Much bigger, so you can see some of us, but anybody who didn't raise their hand on the transmit side, you can't see them. So it's not a panacea, it's great. The big ships are probably not gonna run you down it's the smaller ones with AIS who might, but the ones that don't, you're not gonna see them. And then finally, uh, I'm a big fan of radar re reflectors, be visible, have, a, have binoculars. There's only one standard for uh, boat use and it's seven by 50. That means seven times magnification, 50 degrees is the, the uh, viewable angle in, in degrees. The reason that combo is it is that anything tighter, 8X, 9X, 10X, like you see for bird watching, et cetera, is effectively too narrow a view. It's like a straw. You're looking through a straw in a moving vessel. Seven is good enough and the 50 is the key, really good for light, light gathering, et cetera, um, to make other vessels more visible. Up boat at me. I hailed by the name. Nice. Oh, yeah. So they, what? Do you know what my boat? Yeah. Right. No, I'm a huge fan of AS. Don't get me wrong. But by having AS doesn't mean you have to stop being, you can stop being a lookout. You know, lots of other vessels. Um, and so let's talk briefly about collision avoidance. From a rules of the road perspective, and this is not me being a retired naval officer. I expect everybody to know and study this. Now there's lots of study versions. There, this, is the, this is the Coast Guard Navigation Rules and Regulations, the Collision Regulations, Coal Regs, um, International and Inland. You're required if your vessel's over 40 feet to have it on board, um, but everybody needs to study this. Now today I'm not gonna, that, that's an entire you know, two hour lesson just to dig into the rules of the road. So I'm covering the ones that you no kidding have to understand. No kidding, absolutely commit them to memory. And so I'm not gonna brief the text, which is you know the vessel that has the other vessel to starboard is the standoff. It's like, okay, what? You, there's a standoff and a give way. The term right of way does not exist. Stricken from the book in the 70s, you never have a right to steam anywhere. You are either the give way vessel, the one who has to maneuver, or the one who, by the rules, is required to maintain course and speed. And so the crossing situation is the one that you are going to experience dozens of times every single time you get underway. This is a crossing situation. Here's the little picture. Sorry, it's a little grainy. The way to remember this is what 
color navigation light does each boat have on this side? Anyone? Red. Red, port, left. All short. And in the case of buoys, all even numbers. Red, port, left, even. All short little words. Right side is green, right, green, starboard. Long words. You look at night, or if you were at night, I always say, it's like, okay, crossing situation, vessel to starboard, or you say to yourself, and to me this is the ultimate memory aid, if this was at night, what color would I see on his boat? Red. Red, red. red means stop. stop. Now, you can either stop, red means give way. And the rules prescribe turn to starboard unless it's impossible to do. And now, now in the esoterics of the rules, it's when two vessels crossing such that risk of collision exists. If they're miles and miles away, this risk of collision does not exist. It is if two vessels are crossing such that risk of collision exists, the vessel that has the other to starboard shall turn to starboard or otherwise to pass the stern. What would you see at night? It's red. Red means stop. If it, this guy, if you were on the green boat, what color do you see at night? You would see his, the blue vessel's green running light. Green means go. He is required by the rules to maintain course and speed. Sir. What, what giveaway vessel is the newly minted destroyer USS Carl M. Levin coming from? <laughs> there you have the uh, vessel that is required to maneuver only in the channel. And the rule states, thou shalt not impede a vessel who can only travel in the channel. So the port starboard rule does not apply because the start of this rule says, rules 9, 10, and 13 notwithstanding, one is the, the channel rule, the other is uh, overtaken, and then uh, and, and 18, which is the pecking order. So uh, you know, vessels that are not under command can't comply, et cetera. We'll, How close can you get to a newly minted destroyer? That then applies the Coast Guard rules codified in Code of Federal Regulations, which is the uh, military exclusion zone. And well, the gunboat you. Yes, well, no, no, yeah, I mean, like when, when I was in command and, and years earlier, we always had our small boat in the water to do that initial intercept to determine hostile intent so that enthusiastic sailors on my vessel with 50 cows wouldn't respond. But I want to stir it. Yeah, no, you're good. If you, I mean, it's called the Naval Vessel Exclusion Zone, and I cannot remember the yardage. I want to say it's 250 yards, but it might be 500 yards. 500 yards, that's a long way. And it's Naval Vessel Specific applies to any, you know, and when in doubt, if it's gray or white with a big red stripe on it, then stay clear. Depends. They're, they are not required to transmit. Again, when I was in command, I always transmitted naval vessel, and especially in inland waters like in the Chesapeake, they should be. Um, post the collisions in Japan, that was changed. And in fact, they used my squadron documents to change that. My thought was, if you can be seen visually by lots of other vessels, the enemy knows you're approaching Copenhagen. So when you get within a certain number of miles, turn it on, but it'll typically be cryptic. Sometimes it'll be, you know, DDG-121. You can call, you know, Naval Vessel 121. Usually it'll say government vessel or naval unit. Sir. So uh, what if the other vessel is only a right and passes you and takes a left and gets in front of you? Ah, great question. And you become the UA vessel? No, you do not. The rules are very clear that over time, the, the question was what happens if somebody overtakes you from behind and then turns. The rules are very clear that an overtaking situation, which is when someone is approaching you 22.5 degrees abaft of the beam or the exact position at night in which they would only see your white stern light, if they're approaching you from that direction, then it's an overtaking situation. The vessel who's overtaking you has to keep clear and the rule's very clear that at no point if the relative angle between the two vessels change, does an overtaking situation become a crossing? Or does a head-on situation become a crossing because the angle has changed? Whatever it started with is what applies the whole time. So no, they cannot 
overtake you and then cross your back. They're still going to do it, but, <laughs> sir. When you hail other vessels of international waters, are, are the other captain, is the other captain required to speak English? Yes, absolutely. I am, IMO rules 100%. English is the, the language of the sea. No, no, it used to be French in the 60s. I mean, it was optional. It was French and English together because it's part of the UN. And, you know, but no, it's all 100% English. Absolutely. And, and now, there may not be an English speaker on watch, but in the Chesapeake, you encounter any ship, a Maryland pilot or a Virginia pilot is on board, an American who speaks perfect English, and he's going to be doing all the talking on the radio. But if you're, if you're offshore, they will get someone quickly to the bridge who speaks English. Here's the other one that you're going to experience repeatedly back to that discussion of if your auto routing takes you on this gentle curve on your way to Annapolis and puts you continually in the left lane of traffic, you're gonna be repeatedly experiencing a head-on situation or meeting situation. Both vessels are required to turn to starboard for a port-to-port -port passage. Now, it says preferred. You can do a starboard to starboard. The, a different section of the rules says whatever course correction you make in either of these situations, must be clear and obvious to the other vessel. You've got to send them a signal. Coming right like 10 degrees, even if your course over ground line or, or your uh, ARPA collision avoidance calculator tells you you've got a decent CPA, you need to come 30 or 40 degrees or more to show them a different light, show them a different side of your bow so that they realize, okay, good, he's complying, he or she is complying with the rules of the road if you, in fact, are the giveaway vessel because there's another rule which says it is ultimately the responsibility of both vessels and if, quote, actions by the giveaway vessel alone are not sufficient to avoid collision, then the stand-on vessel also is required to maneuver. But if you do this early enough, somebody's zooming down the bay straight towards you, you come around like 15 or 20 degrees so they can see your turn and they can see it on radar, they do the same, you do a nice, safe port-to-port -port passage. The phrase left is rarely right applies in both of these. In, in that crossing situation, turning to the left to avoid that vessel only works if you turn way, turn left and go the other way. Similarly, turning left is an option, but it's not the preferred and it's not what I expect. We all should read the same book, therefore we all should expect that. And then finally, rule 18. The bottom line is, None of this applies to us, with exception of the sailing vessels here. Um, meaning, if in doubt, if you think it's a commercial fishing vessel, or constrained by draft doesn't happen in the United States, only international waters, if someone's displaying restricted ability to maneuver, like a dredge, ball diamond ball visible in their superstructure, big black ball diamond ball, not under command, uh, three black balls, a drift or whatever, or they're saying it on the radio, stay out of their way. They are, they have privileges by that status. Now I zoom in on F and, and the little memory aid on the right, new reels catch fish, so purchase some weekly is a great way. There's also some inappropriate, more ribald versions to memory aids that you may be familiar with. We're teaching this one today. Um, fishing, emphasis on commercial. Nobody in the bay except down by Norfolk the Menhaden guys who were pulling huge nets into big circles and heaving them, or maybe the vessel that is harvesting the pound net at the moment they're attached to the net. The rules are very clear. Fishing vessel, not only do they have to, I mean, they like apply for this status, and it's in their insurance and all that stuff. To be a fishing vessel in the rules of the road terms, your gear must hamper your ability to maneuver. Not the same as restricting your ability to maneuver, but your gear must somehow be hard, like you're pulling you know, shrimp trawlers off the Mississippi Gulf Coast, or pulling huge, big, heavy trawls on the bottom, and it's really hard for them to turn. Good old boys with a couple of lines in the water are not fishing vessels per the rules of the road. Harrington Harbor North head boats with 20 good old boys with lines in the water are not commercial fishing vessels per the rules of the road. They have no privilege. And we talked earlier about the, the, the must maintain the channel rule. The Yahoo who's fishing in the middle of a channel 
and your boat drove five or six, I mean like Harrington North, you're going out this incredibly skinny spot and there's a guy fishing, it's because he hasn't actually read the book, but he heard when he was drinking a beer at Dockside, oh yeah man, fishing vessels, I'm good to go. Everybody's gotta stay out of my way. No, you'll still run them down so you can't hit them, but um, you can have a discussion off your bridge wing as they get out of the way. Yes, sir? So what about the, uh, the crammer who is stopping and picking up the cram drop, going to the next one? They're not restricted in the new bridge. They don't have something that's like big net. Right. They are going down the line of cram pops. Yeah, they're, they're not. They don't comply. No, they won't. Okay. They're, they're not going to maneuver. I'm just saying is that they're, you know, to truly claim the privilege. Now, the other, with those guys, sometimes there's one guy running the traps. He's not looking out the window. He's paying attention. He's restricted by his gear because his focus is elsewhere. That's the difference. I mean, if you've watched the movie Deadly Catch, you know those guys are exhausted and overworked and barely paying attention to anything around them except the pots. So, yes, stay clear. All right, we're going to go into anchoring quickly, and I know I'm over time. Uh, and if anybody needs to bolt, because I've got to be back at one for the next one. Um, most anchors are really good. Some are better. I currently have a, uh, a Delta anchor, which is kind of the blend of of a claw and Mantis Rachna. Overall, Mantis wins. If you can afford a Mantis or Rachna, I encourage you to do that. Um, here, here's a bunch of data. I know it's an eye chart, but uh, there are plenty of things, ways online that you can assess which ones have better holding. Um, some are specifically good for the bay, but Rachna and Mantis definitely win overall. Um, but all of them do pretty well, and as long as you're not out in a storm or anchoring in in uh, you know, Antarctica, you'll be fine. Um, be ready, make sure that your anchor's secured. Your shackle should be shackled to the anchor. If you've got a swivel, it should not be right next to the anchor. It should be attached with its own short line so you don't get binding. Um, <clears throat> and then you, know, you don't want the boat popping off, or the anchor popping off, so there's ways to keep your anchor on deck when you're not ready to anchor. But when you're actually gonna do it, um, Certainly, we talked about briefing, brief the plan, get the anchor ready to go, stop the boat, slight sternway. I've got these in quotes because those are the commands that we use on our boat. I encourage you to come up with something similar. Let go of the anchor. Some boats, the person on the bow has to do it, or you can power down if you've got a windlass. Fully release the brake or power down with the windlass. And then five to one scope, and that is, check the little diagram here, you add your own height of your bow roller to the surface of the water plus the depth. So if I'm anchoring in seven feet of water, my bow roller's three feet up, that's 10 feet total. I need at least 50 feet of line out and it's to get the anchor pulling at the correct angle to hold me at the bottom. I've seen repeatedly when we've been anchored, other boats come by and they'll just put the tiniest bit of anchor and, and road in the water as if the anchor's got some magic claw effect on the ground. Your, your anchor holds your chain in place. Your chain catenary keeps shock absorbing. Weight does matter. Heavier anchors do better. But the number one biggest contributor is having enough scope out. So if you feel like you're dragging, lots of apps will tell you you're dragging. Continue to take position. This is a time where you can zoom way in on your chart plotter, turn on track. So And then you, if you start seeing little tiny squiggly lines as your boat's kind of hanging around the anchor, you know you're good. If you see that little track line going straight in one direction, you're dragging, you don't need to re-anchor, you need to put out more line. There's no such thing as a bad bottom. Your anchor will bite, they're all designed that even if they turn over, they're gonna turn right back up and dig in. Getting enough scope is the key. Yes, sir? Uh, there's nothing like having too much chain or too much drop. Right? Correct, you can never have too much chain. It's just more work to get back in, especially if your windless breaks. Um, but yeah, the, when in doubt, do more. And, and you see the specifics here, you know, overnight, eight to one ratio. If you're expecting weather, at least 10 to one um, in this situation. If you're in 20 feet of water, that's 100, 100 feet of line. Um, you may have heard of kellets, which are these weighted objects that you slide down your line. All the data shows they don't work for increased holding. They do work to, as a shock absorber or to keep the boat from hunting around. Um, there are products available or you can make your own a line to attach to the anchor so you can see where it is and then if it gets fouled, retrieve it. Um, I'm not gonna say that they're pointless, but I, I went on blogs of a lot of long range cruisers and many of them 
said, you know, they've, they've tried it and it got tangled on their line or on their gear. If you do consider using this, it's nice to see where your anchor was, but then come forward and actually take the buoy on board so that it doesn't get fouled. But, um, and then finally, some recommended reading. I've got them laid out in what I consider kind of order of preference. I mean, this one's, this one's just a guide, but uh, you know, I want you to know the rules of the road. And there are some very handy little placards um, as, as reminders. Here, here's on one side, it's got the same uh, buoyage diagram that I had on a previous slide. On the other, it's got the rules of the road as well as nights that you see at night or lights that you see at night. I, I've got one on my boat. I, I think of myself as an experienced mariner. It's not a bad little reference, especially for inexperienced crew. If they're at the helm, great thing to have. Next in order, I encourage everybody to get the latest version of Nigel Calder's amazing book, How to Read an Article Chart. And then pretty much my favorite, even though it's got kind of what sounds like a basic title, Boat Navigation for the Rest of Us, Captain Bill Brogdon, uh, the late Captain Bill Brogdon, Coast Guard Captain, buoy tender, master navigator. I have used this book on every ship that I've served on to train junior officers because it is so intuitive. Next is Chapman's, which is everything rolled into one. And then finally, if you want really in-depth radar training and how to optimize the radar on your boat, Radar for Mariners by, by David Birch. Um, even though paper charts are uh, about to be completely unavailable, many companies like MapTech or for Canada, um, the Richardson's uh, sell combination chart kits. They're very effective for voyage planning and I encourage everybody to have the latest version. I like this MapTech 15th edition, I think is the latest, but if there's a 16th out there, buy it. Don't buy a used one because they, you know, it's, it's only as good as the last time they printed it, but excellent tool for having in your cockpit, doing long range voyage planning and to double check your paper chart versus that. Last question, yes ma'am. No longer, no, no, the, the ENCs are meet, meet the requirement and have for, for many years now. I still have them, as you can see, but uh, um, you know, that, that's the most affordable. I mean, these were at last purchased $27 each. The entire book of the entire Chesapeake and Delaware Bay is $100. So it's a much more affordable way to do it and, and easy to flip as you're using it. All right, I've gone way over time. I apologize. Uh, thank you for, very much. <laughs>